Hello everyone and welcome back to day seven of Bitwise where we build a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Uh, if you watch day six, you'll know that uh, where we left off was we started working on some of the scaffolding for order independent declarations. And um, that was Friday for me, it's now Monday for me. Uh, and I spent you know like a day and a half this weekend working on, uh, well, partly trying to move that further uh, the, like the work we started, but also on various other cleanup. Um, and so uh, the, the plan is to to kind of continue that work, maybe in a slightly different direction than originally uh, anticipated, but to continue that work today. Um, but before we get there, I just want to run over some, uh, some administrative stuff. Uh, first thing is a bunch of people have requested this, and I finally went and did it. Um, there's now a git tag for each day's code. And so uh, if you go and do a checkout of, you know, git checkout uh, of day six, for example, uh, you'll be able to see the state of the repository as of day six. And I did that for all the past days where we had code and um, we'll, we'll now do that going forward. So this should make it, um, you know, I've also linked uh, specific commits and files and stuff in past uh, notes, but uh, this should make it you know, you're, you're going to get a, a full slice of a repository now uh, just using these, and it's going to be a uniform naming scheme and so on. So that should that should help folks. Um, so th thanks for the people that suggested that. I'd actually had it on my list for a while, but uh, someone reminded me once again this morning, and I just decided to finally do it. It didn't take more than five minutes. So uh, check that out and let me know if any of the tags are, are off. Uh, another bit of news. Um, we now have an annotated uh, episode guide. So, so let me just show you that. Um, I guess that not, isn't really the thing I wanted. Just one sec. Um, so yeah, right now, of course we don't have a logo, but right now we have up to day three where um, if you go to this URL, it's annotated. Uh, has the has some of the, the Twitch questions included in line, um, and you can jump to stuff and, and 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 see it. So so the hope is that for people who are not you know following along uh, in real time, and I realize that it's a huge time commitment to follow the videos, that the annotated episode guide will really um, will really help people sort of jump in and, and find stuff that looks interesting and and so on. Uh, and this was done by. Um, well, his nickname is Miblo del Carpio. He's done this kind of thing for, for Handmade Hero and other Handmade Network projects in the past. Um, real name, Matt, Matt Maschenhaus, I guess. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, so I've been working with him to make this happen. You can see his, uh, his Twitter account here if you want to go uh, you know, encourage him or, or whatever, uh, give him feedback. Uh, and I also encourage you to give feedback on the Bitwise forums uh, you know, for, for people who are not able to uh, to follow along, especially, I would say, you know, how useful are, are the annotations for um, being able to sort of keep up a little bit and jumping back in uh, and so on. Like, how, is, is it the right level of detail? Uh, and also, how useful is it beyond the existing, you know, stream notes we have here and so on? So, like, uh, feedback on that stuff would be great so that, uh, you know, if it, if it makes sense for him to continue doing that, uh, we, would, we would both uh, love to know about that. So, so please post in the forums if you have any feedback. Um, aside from that, let's do a quick diff review of what was checked in since last time. Um, boom, boom, boom. I'm not, well, I guess I could bring up the, uh, the GitHub page and then we'll actually look at the code in the editor. I actually don't like looking at code and, and the diffs because it's too hard to see a lot of the context. Um, so something I did after the stream ended was, um, based on some feedback, uh, I went through and I guess both optimized and cleaned up the buff sprint up function a little bit. So now it uh, doesn't do a dummy pass to figure out the length of the formatted data it has to append. It tries to, you know, it tries to do it in one pass and only if there's not enough capacity does it have to resize the buffer and try again. So um, the other thing this improved is I removed a special case in the handling of the zero terminator. So now, um, and this is inspired by a blog post by uh, Nicholas Gray on rmachinery.com where he talks about sort of his version of this. Um, now the zero terminator is not counted as part of the string length. 
um, but it is included. And this just simplified some of the pointer math and special removed some of the special cases for dealing with the zero terminator. Um, so that's really the main improvement there. Otherwise, it's functionally equivalent to the old version, but it just kind of reduced the code. Uh, now only uses a single SN, SN printf on the fast path. And like I said, simplified the special casing for the null terminator. So uh, that was one improvement. Uh, the other thing was, this was mostly busy work or just sort of janitorial work that I did uh, after getting annoyed with uh, the order independent declaration work this weekend. But I went through and basically um, cleaned up some of the parsing code and AST code just a tiny bit. So one thing was I moved all the different uh, tagged union data cases into the struct itself. So you can now, it's just reduced on some of the code. Uh, and now you can kind of see the different auxiliary data in line. And so we did that for everything. Um, and then the other thing I did was, you may recall that um, for a lot of this stuff here, let's see, what's a good example? I guess this is a good example. Um, for a lot of stuff like this, um, where you build, you build up a temp buffer, um, that's another case, this might be a better case. For a lot of these cases here where the parser builds up temp buffers, uh, a variable length lists, uh, you'll recall we used to do something called AST dupe right in the parser code. Um, that's not the right file. Um, we used to call this function directly from the parser code and uh, that really didn't belong there on, on second look. And so now the way it works is uh, all the copying and, and memory management for these variable length structs uh, or variable length uh, lists or is now handled by the data constructors for the various AST case uh, cases. And so you just pass, uh, you know, you just pass the, the pointer and the, and the length of the list uh, directly. And if you go to a function like decal aggregate, um, you'll see that it now does this AST dupe. Um, it does that sort of internally. So that's how it should have been from the beginning. It means that this code here is now free of any sort of uh, irrelevant memory management stuff that's really not its responsibility. So it, it simplified the code a little bit. Um, and really all this does is it's just a macro in order that, that just calls AST dupe with the right size and then returns a pointer to the copy. And so that's really it. Um, and I also added, yeah, to, to go along with that, I also added a new uh, constructor function for statement lists, which used to be called statement blocks, um, which does this duplication for you as well. And so again, if you uh, look at this file and you call statement list, you can see uh, rather than constructing a statement list type directly, it just calls this constructor function, which is responsible for copying stuff um, into the AST arena. So anyway, uh, that was just the sort of janitorial stuff I did. I just wanted to quickly mention it. Um, so yeah, let's let's try to talk about where we left off. Um, if you'll recall, the thing where the thing we left off is, I mean, we did a, a simple placeholder, simple table, and then we did some um, we did some some type constructors that did basically you know hash consing or interning. But, but not for strings, but for um, pointer uh, or for, uh, for types um, rather than string data. And um, I think this is, I mean, given that it's incomplete and right now it's using a linear list for the caching, other than that, I mean, I think it's, it's more or less the right idea. Uh, I, and I was not sure at the time whether it was the right way to go, but uh, afterwards, uh, after the stream, someone pointed out to me that LVM actually does this too. They call it type uniquing. So it's the idea that any uh, any type has a unique instance in the LVM, uh, like you know a given LVM, I guess context, um, except for things that are supposed to be distinct, like different structs or whatever, uh, which we also don't in, uh, we don't also don't uniquify in our system. So that was kind of you know good confirmation that um, that that this is a good idea for this kind of application. Uh, so so I think the overall approach there is. Um, is probably sound and, and we'll fine tune it as we go. Um, and, th and that's basically where we left off. Now that's not where I, th th that's not where I stopped. Uh, I worked a bunch this weekend on order independent like declarations. Um, you'll recall the, or the sort of the high level algorithm uh, that we talked about was to essentially, um, 
do this kind of dependency directed recursion uh, where we visit uh, we visit all the different AST nodes kind of recursively to discover dependencies. And my original idea was during that resolution pass, we would not only resolve the order of declarations ultimately, we would also um, we would also really do everything related to the AST that passed parsing, except for for, for backend specific code gen. And so in particular, the idea was that this would this would resolve types as well and do type checking. So if you have a type def uh, and you try to resolve you know that declaration for ordering, it would not only resolve the ordering, but since it's already visiting uh, the type structure of that type def, it's like hey let's actually create the, the type instance for the fully resolved type. And similarly for structs and for vars and so on, you know, hey, if, if we have to resolve the dependencies for a const uh, definition, declara sorry, const declaration, let's actually not only do the type checking and type inference for that constant expression, let's also do the constant expression evaluation because we'll need that anyway. And so um, I basically wrote a good chunk of the code for that um, all sort of at once, and the, um, the 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 main thing I discovered as I forced myself to just write that code, and it got up to at least a thousand lines of code, is that even though that approach I still believe is totally viable and may actually be how it ends up once the dust settles, it made it really hard for me to focus on the one strain of the problem that I that was unclear to me. So I know how to, you know, I know how to handle, I know how to do the type checking and type inference and, and constant expression evaluation. But once you combine that with the order independency and some of those subtleties there, um, it, it forced me to consider too many things in parallel. And, uh, and also there's just too much code to write for the stuff not directly related to the ordering. Um, and so it just became hard to focus, like be laser focused on the novelty of the problem, like the specific things of, you know, what forces dependencies and what doesn't. Um, and so kind of disgusted with all that code I wrote, I just kind of deleted it and I decided, hey, for Monday, which is now, let's let's start fresh. Uh, and this may end up changing again once we finish everything else and it turns out we can merge them, but let's start fresh and let's just do the ordering. And the, the idea then is if we just do the ordering and leave the type checking and type resolution and constant expression evaluation for, for a pass after that, then that pass after it will be more like a traditional C compiler um, where I think, you know, I, I know how to handle that and most people know how to handle that. And then once we've done that, maybe it turns out it'll be easy to merge those two back into one thing. But trying to kind of gobble up both at once uh, proved kind of... Uh, overwhelming I guess so um, that's my plan for today let's actually attack the just the ordering part of the problem and so the the ultimate goal of the ordering algorithm is going to be to produce a linear ordered list of declarations of top-level declarations um, and so that's a much more well-defined problem really just visit everything um, and discover dependencies and put things into a list and detect cycles maybe uh, although some kind of cycle detection may be left to the pass after this. But anyway, so that's the plan for today. That's a much more traditional just kind of graph algorithm, uh, topological sort algorithm. And so um, let's let's just dive in and try to do that. Um, and so let's see. So for this, we still need some sort of symbol table to resolve names. Um, but the thing that a name will resolve to is... Um, is probably a little bit different. Uh, like we need to know, let's see. Um, so, so, so basically let's say that we have a function order decal, um, which is take the declaration. And it's basically just going to, um, you know, we have a bunch of different cases. Enums are actually, I, I realized this weekend, are a kind of annoying case for, uh, for ordering stuff. So let's ignore that for now and just look at the others. Um, and so we have, you know, we have, let's just write out the cases. Um, uh, var const type def func. And um, 
let's just break these up. Um, and so the idea is this is basically just going to be kind of a graph walk um, where we're not really trying to produce any complicated result as we walk. We're really just walking the graph and we're trying to detect cycles. Um, and we're going to detect cycles more or less the same original idea of there's going to be some sort of flag associated with uh, the names in the symbol table that tell us whether we're already, we've already ordered something or um, uh, that we haven't even tried to order it before or we're in the middle of ordering it. So it's more or less going to be, the, I think, the same uh, ternary state we had from before, um, but it will just be, you know, it'll be used in a more restricted way for now. Um, and so, for example, if you do uh, order decal var, um, I guess it'll be... Um, I'm just going to remind myself of what's in that uh, for a var, right? So for a var, there's a type spec and an expression, and so I think you basically just do. Um, and honestly, most of this stuff we'll just put it in line. It's so simple. So it's going to be like order. Uh, what was it? Order type spec. Order expression. Um, and for funks, actually, um, I thought this, this was another case I thought about this weekend. For funks, we're actually not going to order them as part of this pass. So even though for declarations for recursive functions were just things that are defined out of order, um, could be considered a kind of part of this whole ordering thing. Um, I decided for now that it's actually qualitatively different from most of the other complex cases involving value dependency, because you know, for example, one way of handling uh, for declarations of functions is literally just to for declare every single function at the top of the file, um, and then you know, kind of go from there. Like, I'm not saying that's what we're going to do in the final product, but the point is that things that, that things that can be for declared without actually reordering the definitions are actually fundamentally different. Um, from the other cases. And so in any case, I think it makes sense to just um, to not really do anything here um, for now. And, and, and we have to make sure this case doesn't happen. All right. Um, and so this is really just a big uh, recursive block of everything. So what was, you know, let's remove this. Um, For these, I guess we um, um, so what each aggregate consists of what. Um, Oh, right, each of them, I see. So it's really only the type we have to worry about here. Um, right. I mean, even this, let's just put this in line. This is simple enough. Um, see var const the other thing that's annoying about functions by the way um, is that inside functions you have local scope for symbols and so you can't just I mean 
once we do proper type checking and st resolution and stuff, we need a we obviously need local scopes for simple tables. Um, but since all the local scope stuff is not order independent, it's linearly ordered, right? With kind of forward, forward scope, nested block scope, and forward scope. Um, it's kind of a different scheme, and so uh, kind of getting that in the mix here is kind of needlessly complex anyway, um, because we would have to know whether a given name refers to the top level binding for it or a local binding for it. And it's not difficult, but it's actually not required to handle at this level, so that's why I'm leaving it out. Um, And um, all right, and so you can see really most of this is going to break into, let's see, order type spec. Type spec name. Um, and for names, this is you know probably where uh, the big thing is. Um, for now, yeah. Let, for now, let's just do it like this. Um, what do we call it? Okay, it's just called name. Um, the funks. Arrays, we have to visit the element type, but then also visit the constant expression for the for the bounds. Um, and this is one of the interesting cases um, when you're visiting a pointer type of something. Um, you know, you don't you don't need to need, know the size of the base type of a pointer in order to know the size of the pointer type because a pointer pointer type always has the same size. So this is in C why, for example, you can kind of use for you know for declared only say struct types um, and, and you know have values of you know you can do stuff like this in C um, you for declare this and then you can say this and that's totally fine but if you do this it's not fine if you do uh, this it's not fine um, so maybe let's see here how do we want to handle this um, let's just not handle it for now and just visit it like we would anything else um, and then we'll return to it later Okay, okay. Um, it's more case analysis. This kind of code is pretty rote. At least it's not difficult. Um, some of these cases require requires you to do nothing, which is probably yeah, stir as well. Are you to order the name? Let's 
see here. Call operand. Is that what it's called? Compound, compound literals. Um, so this is a, an optional field. All the bricks. Whoop, it's not good. Um, and then order name. Let's still defer that. So what do we have now? Order expression. Um, order name. Order type spec. Type spec down here. Order decal down here. Um, and then order name is really, I guess. Um, let's just reorder, rename them to correspond to what we're calling them now, and there's no auxiliary data. And so, let's see here. Otherwise, uh, take a look at the state. If it's ordered, um, if it's already ordered, then we don't have to do anything. Otherwise, if um, it's in the middle of ordering, it doesn't see the dependency. Otherwise, we have to set the state to ordering, and then when we're done, we'll set it to ordered, and we'll return.
return. Um, and we will do order decal of the declaration. Okay. Um, we also have to actually put it in a list. So once we've ordered something, we have to put it in a list. And so let's have a big list called ordered decals. It's going to be a stretchy buff, of course. And um, once we've actually ordered something, then we can put it in the list. Order test. All right, let's take a bunch of um, uh, let's see here. So let's take a simple case like uh, A equals B. Do I need a semicolon? No, I don't. And then B equals 1. So that's a for declared thing. And then um, let's do sim decal. Actually, I just want to be able to see that in the debugger, so I'm going to split this on a separate line. <sighs> okay. Expected declaration forward dot EOF. Interesting. Must be just a dumb typo. Oh, right. I, 
can it, why can I even pass this directly? Why is it, why is it letting me call this function with an argument? What the heck is going on? Makes no sense. I want to, what the heck was going on there? Why was it letting me call that function? Like, is it K and R? Are we back to 88? What? Oh, it's because it's C and I'm such a C++ moron. So we really are back in K and R. This is crazy. Like, I, I really knew this. I can't believe I've been writing this shit. Okay. That's embarrassing. So it really was K and R. Shit. All right. Um, let's see here. There we go. Yeah, I mean, like, this is stuff I obviously know, but th this is where, you know, spending all my professional time writing C++ code and only doing C at home, I sometimes will mix those conventions up. And by the way, this definitely won't be true in Ion. Like, the, 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 the old KNR stuff, which I guess is still NCC, but seems to me like one of the wackier things they carried over, uh, definitely won't be in Ion. So, yeah. All right. There we go. Okay. And I guess now, um, I mean, I guess I can go through the symbol table. Um, Bufflin. Really, what the way this should work is that there's a top level function, so other decals. And Not enough parameters for argument string. What? That's a weird error. Like now we're just running into weirdness here. Okay, it's because the first. Okay, it was the first error. And it was just the second one was spurious. Really on a roll here today. All right. That didn't do jack. Um, so let's actually step through this and see what's going on. Actually, 
make sure this is there. Try again. Correct. Oh, the problem is it's, yeah, the, it's the name that's doing the ordering. And that's probably, I mean, we could just do like this. I don't know if this is, it should work, but let's just do it that way. Um, Some stuff before. Okay, now we're actually doing stuff. And again. Where is foo coming from? That must. Oh. Yeah, let's take out that junk. I mean, this is, by the way, very poor, poor test hygiene to have tests leave global state in a weird... Right now, there's a lot of global state that's going to be much more hygienically handled, uh, but for now is kind of left uh, hanging. But uh, that's definitely not something you want your test to do. But don't want to change how we manage that right this very second. All right. Okay, so this is obviously a trivial case. Now try, let's try, well, let, let's first try this um, and see what happens. I'm just going to do it up here. So deco, you can see this is for A, which is the first one, and it's going in here. And the first one has nothing to do, so it should just work exactly the same as before. Uh, and then now this should actually descend into the name case. Um, and this thing has already been ordered, so it returns immediately, but that's, oh, that is correct. And then on its way out, it's going to put itself in the ordering and we're good. Okay, let's verify. It should be the same ordering as before. But now let's uh, switch it, not like that, just like this. Um, let's just look, bring up breakpoint, since this is what we'll be wanting to look at. So first, we're dealing with A, and now B hasn't been declared. So when we go down here, it's actually going to descend recursively into the declaration for B. And that should be able to terminate without cycling. So if we now look at ordered decals, uh, well, I so don't have a good debug viewer for that. I want to write out the debug expression. But anyway, that looks right. And then on the way up, it should now push this in. And it's going to visit B a second time, but at that point it should already be ordered, so it won't be entered twice in the list. And so you can see now B came first. Um, and now let's do something illegal very illegal, going to jail for sure. Um, so this is for A, it's going to go into that. And so it's going to start trying to order this one, but in the process, it's going to descend into the name and eh, fatal error. Okay, so that's right. Of course, we don't want to do a true fatal error that actually exit the program, that's just a placeholder. So um, I think that's 
good for these simple cases. Now let's do um, let's do structs. So if I have a field T and I have some field I here. So we don't have to look at it. Um, oh, so we don't need to get that far. Where did that come from? Oh, right now we require semicolons, of course. It's going to go away eventually, but for now we don't do semicolon insertion. Okay, so first we order, um, I guess that's S, and we go through the type specs. This should be the first one, and this should be a name. And that should be T, so that hasn't been ordered yet start ordering it and that should be able to terminate in okay yeah it's because int and stuff like that isn't um, oh, that's interesting things like int need to be how do we handle those in the simple table for now I mean we just need to consider them as already being there basically so Um, this is probably not going to be how it stays, but it would be pretty easy to, to call it like like maybe just have a null decal to mark it or something. Um, no, we'll just call it primitive. For now, we don't have any other data associated with it. It's definitely a bit hacky. You say it's already been ordered. Um, definitely, definitely it's been built in. Um, yeah, definitely not what I would like, how, how I would like it to work, but let's just uh, step that in to be able to get past this uh, issue. Um, so, uh, and then when we do our simple table lookup, that stuff is fine. Uh, we just need to... This is again descending down, finding this thing, cursively trying to order it, and this is going to hopefully terminate in the int case. It's already ordered, so that's great. Um, and then we're done. Okay. So if we look at what it prints, it should. You can see it handles that case. Um, let's do a, a, a 
let's do a case like this, uh, which involves, um, you know, like a constant. Um, then maybe this is like something like this. Disable edit and continue. All right, so you can see um, it figures out the right ordering. It has to declare t before s and n has to be before t. Um, all right, so let's see. So, I mean, we obviously need more test coverage, no doubt. Um, but this is the core of the algorithm, and you can see it's basically just a depth-first search that detects cycles using this ternary state thing. Um, the thing that I'm... Let's see. The thing we still don't handle is for things like pointers, right? So you want to be able to... Um, you want to be able to do stuff like um, like this and right now this will produce a cyclic dependency error because it doesn't really know the difference between oh OBS just disconnected let me just wait for that to reconnect It looks like OBS reconnected. I'm just going to wait for the stream to catch up. Awesome internet connection here. Is the stream back up? Give me a yay or an A on, on chat. Um, so where was I? Yeah, the thing I was talking about, I don't know if, if that got cut off, but I was saying that the thing we don't handle, and that's really the thing that is, I, I, I guess, potentially non-trivial about this whole affair, is what do you do about um, things like the pointer cycles? Because those are, those are benign to a point. Like certainly in type declarations, they're okay. Inside a... Um, if you're talking about inside a an expression, like inside a expression of some sort, including inside a function, um, depending on what you do with the t the pointer type, it may not be fine. Like if you take the size of the dereft thing of a certain pointer type, that requires you to know the full value type contents, not just the fact that it is a type. Um, so there's a question of how to handle this. Um, and I had a few few, few false starts on this with the approach I took this weekend. Um, but that was in the context of trying to gobble up not just ordering, but literally everything else, like type resolution and constant expression evaluation. So there may be a reasonable um, a reasonable way to do it now that we're in a more simple context. And uh, it's also, as I thought through this weekend, I would actually be fine with being less uh, free in what you can do with four declared uh, pointer types than C, because the, the the idioms that I can think of that are important are fairly restricted. Like it's it's, it's stuff like re recursive structures like this, uh, and also inside functions, you want to sometimes be able to work with uh, opaque types that are you know being return from and pass to APIs, but you can't really do anything with them. So effectively, from your point of view, they're just like an opaque pointer-sized thing. And really, all the point, uh, all the compiler is doing from your vantage point is just making sure that you can't necessarily mix them up with other pointer types. But other than that, you're not really doing anything with them. You're not dereferencing them. You're not uh, really getting uh, detailed with them. So that's a little bit, it, when you consider this in the order-independent context, that's a little bit subtle. Um, 
maybe a digression on why this is easy to handle in C. Um, in C, everything is handled, I mean, it was originally designed to be able to, well, actually, I guess all the original compilers were multi-pass. But this kind of thing, the way C handles it, is really easy to handle in a one-pass compiler because when you see, uh, in, in C, when you see something like this, um, C just puts a symbol table entry in there and it says, hey, there's a type and it just sets the type is undefined. And uh, then if you make a pointer type to that undefined type, it's like, hey, that's fine, um, and so on. But then if you actually do something with it that it can't do with an undefined type, like taking the size of the element type or accessing a field or whatever, it will just error at that point. And so that's pretty easy to do when you're just sort of doing it in a demand-driven way. So you just kind of fill in the undefined type in the table and then if you do, if in the course of compiling and using that type, you do something with it that you can't support with an undefined type, you just say, hey, it's an undefined type, you can't do that. Um, but it's, if you're trying to do ordering decoupled from all this other stuff of how it's used, from the details of how it's used, then it's, uh, I think, quite a bit more complicated. So one thing we could do, and this is maybe, what uh, this is what I was planning on doing with this new approach, is to actually not detect cycles, even though I know we're detecting cycles right now. Um, I was planning to not detect cycles in this ordering pass. So this this ordering pass, right? I know right now we're detecting cycles, but my plan was actually um, not to detect cycles, but just to produce an ordering. And that ordering may actually be wrong in the sense that there could be cyclic value dependencies that ultimately cannot be resolved. Like if, if instead of there being this pointer type here, it would be like this then there's obviously no ordering of these S and T declarations that will work. Um, but so I think what simplifies this problem back to the same level of complexity as C is if our ordering pass tries to sort it, but if it finds a cycle, it just basically, I mean, it, it, it generates, you know, it generates an ordering. It just won't be a true partial ordering that respects the dependencies. Um, but then when you actually do the type resolution and all this other stuff afterwards in the order generated by our ordering pass, um, because that is the point where you know exactly what you're doing with the types, it's very easy to then say, given that we've processed things in linear order and sort of a best effort linear order, we can actually detect some of those cases more easily there. So um, maybe people after the stream and Q&A have thoughts on whether that's the right approach, but it seems to me that... Um, that's a way of decoupling the complexity of order and dependency from some of the complexities of C's type system to the point where we can now, after the ordering, just do everything like C would, which is fairly straightforward. Um, so um, what that means, so hopefully that justifies at least my angle of attack, and maybe, I'm, maybe this won't work either, but what I like about it is that a lot of C's complexity in terms of what you can do in, at, at compile time and the type system in terms of constant expressions and all this other stuff kind of intermingling is, is kind of based on you know, a linear compilation ordering. And so by doing it this way, we can kind of do the stuff that's non-C-like first, and then we can do everything else in a linear C-like fashion in terms of how we process the types and validate them and evaluate constant expressions and so on. Um, Uh, so, so before I move on, I do actually, normally I only do Q&A at the end, but maybe I'll do something right now because um, if I'm going down the wrong path, I would trust some people to catch me here. So so Sean is saying, what what case prevents you from not ordering into pointer decals? If you said it, I missed it. So um, let's see here. Yeah, so someone's asking about if order independent declarations query, first do a scan through the top levels, uh, register in the names in the symbol table as unresolved, then do a full pass and do your recursive type resolution as you go. I mean, that's more or less what I'm planning on doing. Um, I'm, I'm not traversing into functions even for that first pass because it's technically not needed. Uh, because, the idea, I mean, if you think of in terms of what C code will ultimately be produced, I, I expect all the functions to be sort of at the bottom, and then you can do four declarations of functions as needed. Um, or even reordering, but um, yeah. So I, I think this is reasonable. Um, but, but to answer Sean's question about why, why can't you just order into pointer decals? Well, if you look at what we're doing right now, um, when you traverse something like this, 
you could, I mean, the easy thing to do is to say, well, um, you don't, you can do this, right? Like you could just say when you traverse into a pointer type, you actually don't visit the things recursively. Um, someone's asking if this only needed for the C backend. No, I mean, it kind of applies for everything because once you have to start computing sizes of things, you need things to be ordered. Um, but the point is that it would be nice to separate the ordering from everything else so that once you go and compute sizes of all the types, they're already in an order where your dependencies have already had their si sizes computed, for example. And if they haven't, that means you have a true value dependency. So part of the goal of splitting the ordering from the other stuff is that the, all the other things will be a lot more straightforward. Um, they don't have to worry about ordering things on demand. They just have to worry about validating that the ordering is consistent. So if you try to compute the size of something when computing the size of your own type, like you have a struct type, it has a field. You need to know the size of each of the field types. Um, if in the course of computing that, you find out something hasn't had its size already computed, that means there's a sort of value level cyclic dependency rather than just a sort of pointer type thing. Um, but yeah, I think actually using C as a sort of, like using it just as a way of, 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 of focusing your, your mental model about what's legal, even though obviously C is not like the ground truth, but the reason C requires certain things is usually for good reasons. Um, and what it what it allows, you know, when it when it allows you to use undefined types as point as purely as pointer types, for example, that's that that has good reasons too. It has to do with the fact that from the machine's point of view, for example, uh, all pointer types are the same, and so it can it's no it knows the size of a pointer type regardless of what the base types thing is. So if you have an int star or a void star or a float star, they're all the same size. And so just using C, sort of our, our knowledge of C as as an intuition pump for for which cases are or easy or hard is just really what I'm trying to do. It's not that C is necessarily ultimately the constraint because when we do machine code, we won't go through C, right? Um, but yeah, so so basically you could do something like this where um, when you traverse into a pointer type, you, you don't try to order the, um, you don't try to order um, the, the, the element type associated with that. And then of course you would have to forward it, like in order, for example, for the C code generating backend to be really easy, the easy thing to do would be literally for it, and I'm, this is not you, what you would do in the final polished version, but you could literally forward declare all the types at the top of the file, declare all the types and constants, forward declare all the functions, define all the functions. Um, and supposing you did that just as a bootstrapping method, what cases would still be non-trivial? Well, it would be the stuff we're handling here because you would still have to declare constants before you can use them in array bounds, for example. And you would still need um, to you know, have a full definition of a type before you use it as a non-pointer field type in, in another type definition. So, um, sorry, that's a little bit rambling, but maybe it makes sense. Um, I think this is actually maybe the right choice um, because if you do this, then and we and we do most of the wor work of actually validating that the ordering is like we still have to do some work in the, in the, the pass after this to to figure out um, whether the ordering is actually valid semantically. Um, if if we just do it like this, I think that would actually work. Um, but the, it means we have to do a little bit more work in the second pass. But I think we we can't get away from that given if we want to have some level of parity with what C allows here. Um, so I'm waiting for a nod from, from Sean to see whether that's totally bogus, if that's kind of what he had in, in mind when he talked about why we can't just, um, yeah. All right, let me just read what he's saying. All right, yeah, the previous line, I see. So Sean's, so Sean's talking, let me just write it in, let me just copy and paste it so, um, so people understand what he's talking about. Um, so yeah, if you take this case right here, the way I'm currently handling it, it would end up essentially um, using an ordering that amounts to this. So it wouldn't detect a cyclic dependency, but it would, you know, reorder things correctly. Um, 
and that seems reasonable. So maybe, yeah, maybe let's do it this way, where we don't traverse into pointer types for the ordering, and then during the next pass where we do kind of real type resolution and constant expression evaluation and whatnot, uh, we just have to uh, we have to validate that we we're not forced to to yeah anyway so so let's do it that way which then makes the second pass after the ordering much more like a traditional C compiler which is kind of what we're trying to achieve anyway all right um, and let's just validate that case Sean has well, let's first do this where it's just um, this thing should still result in an error after this change so let's see yep so that's a fatal cyclic dependency um, if I now turn this into this there shouldn't be an issue. Um, but if I now do this, oh, and actually, let me just verify what the order is. It should be the declaration order. Yep. Um, but now if I do this, which is Sean's example, then it does have to reorder T before S, but there's there shouldn't be a, an overall cyclic dependency error. So T comes first and then S, all right. Um, so that's maybe fine. Let's think about enums maybe before we move on to the other stuff. Um, right, so one of the annoying things about enums, it's not super annoying, but um, you know, enums, aside from defining a type, an enum also introduces a bunch of constants. And the individual items in the enum um, are not out of order relative to each other. They actually have, you know, if, if, if you don't have an expli explicit initializer expression, like, you know, A, B, C, um, that means, you know, A is zero, B is implicitly dependent on the previous item and so on. So even though these are sort of top level scope uh, symbols, they, they, they don't really participate in the out of order stuff. So I think really what you want to do is if, if someone depends on a constant that's an enum constant, they have to, like the enum as a whole has to precede it, right? So it's like it depends on the enum, even if it's depending on a constant. Um, and then the constants in here are basically, you know, they're kind of pre-ordered. They just go in the order they're defined in. So once the enum gets ordered, uh, all of the symbols here get ordered or something like that. Um, or, I mean, we don't even have to, we don't even have to treat these symbols like the ABC. We don't even have to treat those as really being the things we're ordering per se. The thing we're really interested in is ordering the declarations. But normally declarations have a one-to-one, -one for now, have a one-to-one -one relationship with symbols in the global symbol table. But for enums, that's not true. There's both the enum type, but also those constant it introduces, which have to couple, like they, they're carried along with the, with the declaration. So that's why they're a little bit annoying. I mean, they're not deeply annoying, but they're a little bit of an odd case compared to the others. Um, Sean, Sean's saying, uh, I'm not going to allow kind of out of order enum stuff. Yeah, I was I was planning not to handle uh, like Sean's example is you have two different enums and their constants are cross coupled, but in a way that is uh, not truly cyclic. And I yeah I wasn't planning on handling that. Um, the the easy so, so I actually I know the, the thing I did yesterday when I was doing my giant mess of a all in one type resolver and orderer uh, a declaration orderer was basically would have handled the case uh, Sean is talking about because I was basically treating each of the enum items as having an implicit, um, you know, basically if they had a, um, if they had no initializer expression, they were implicitly dependent on their predecessor in the enum. And so that would introduce like, and, and, and I also evaluated the constant expression associated with that. So you had all the constants for the enums, um, which meant that effectively there was like an implicit you know, previous item plus one, or in the case of the first entry, just equal to zero uh, for all of those. And they were basically just introduced as sort of virtual constant declarations into the global namespace. And that was kind of nasty, but it did make it fairly easy to handle the case Sean is talking about. Uh, but I was planning on not doing that, actually. Uh, I think it's reasonable, but um, 
it's also something we can revisit if it turns out to be a big uh, pain, in, pain in the butt uh, for, for practical coding, but I don't think so. Most of the time when you have enums, they tend to be kind of a, a well, certainly in the case where you're not just using them for constants. I mean, unlike C, we actually have a constant expression declaration that, you know, sometimes in C I use this idiom for uh, just declaring integer constants. Uh, we don't really need this in ion because we have const, which uh, serves the same purpose as that would have. And so really you're only using enum when you're actually using enumerations. And it seems like in that case, there's the cyclic dependency between two different enums is really a case that uh, is not very usable. Um, and so I was planning on skipping it. But anyway, that was my thinking. And so I did handle it yesterday in my crazy, crazy all-in-one resolver, but uh, decided that was too much headache and for, for no good reason. All right, um, so let's see here. Um, once we've done this, so, so, so what do we have at the end of this whole process? So I haven't handled enums. Maybe I'll actually handle enums off stream because I want to think a little bit more about the best way to handle it with the symbol table um, and stuff. Well, actually, no. I already feel bad about the whole built-in thing. Clearly, for now, this is not really the true simple table that we're going to use for type resolving. This is really more like the the simple table version we're using for ordering. But anyway, if you um, if you introduce a special kind, then you could do stuff like I don't know, maybe built-in dacl. An enum const or something like that. Let's just say that. Um, and then um, Maybe we don't really need that. Although it's probably a good idea regardless. Because it also kind of accounts for why this thing here is logically part of, of a tagged human that so it isn't valid for some cases like built-ins. Um, Let's do it like that, and then say enum const. Um, something like this. Um, by the way, the Visual Studio, like despite the fact that Visual Studio has support for um, for C ninety nine, the auto indenter has absolutely no clue about this stuff. You can see it's totally confused. Um, yeah, totally confused. It's very frustrating. Um, all right, so this is in const. Already ordered. Um,
Um, I should also say if simget something in. Actually, I, there should be. Placeholder could be a little bit more centralized in a bit. It's too much redundancy, but for now I'll just do this. Um, and then if this is enum, we're also going to code is not pretty, but I just want to get it in there so we can see that it works. Um, and let's see, so we also don't right now. So for order type spec, um, I can leave that as this. Try a simple case. Um, so when we go in here, actually, before I handle that, um, I should verify that the old stuff is still working because I changed the simple table code a little bit. So let's um, see here. So global sims, let's just say 10. Um, just before we go in. So now we have the E entry. And we go in here. And we add a bunch of these. So now the A is in. B, C. All right. So these are all entered now in the symbol table. There's the int. So this should be an enum. Okay, 
so that's not really <laughs> because we're doing so there we're getting multiple entries in the order decal oh right we, we need like there's basically two cases depending um, I guess that's one problem the thing we're ordering is not really the symbols, but the enum itself. So having that associated with the symbol rather than the declaration is a problem. Um, it's not really hard to handle, but it's a little bit unclean. Um, let's just do it like this. If sim um, this is a little bit hacky, but it will work. Uh, if sim of any kind is sim decal. This, this needs to be cleaned up overall, so I don't want anyone to think that's this is a good way of doing it, but all right. And so now let's introduce some dependencies. For example, um, let's say we put this at the bottom, and then we want A of these, which I guess is zero, and let's do B maybe. But it matters because it doesn't even know that it's zero at this point, but let's see what happens. Uh, so that's definitely not right. So it should have said, let's see why it didn't. struct and this should go in here and should go into an array. This is the one I would expect since there's weird name. This is oh I know what oh it is B. Okay, it just over initialized. This should be the enum now, right? Yep. Yeah, this begin this is this is definitely like I didn't factor the, the data structures right again because I think of ordered decal. Really the, the ordering belongs not associated with the symbol table entry but with the declaration itself. So I need to change that, but I'm just going to finish the stream to get that done. Um, but that's bitten me twice now, and it's just conceptually clearly the wrong, the wrong organization. So all that stuff belongs on the declaration, not on the symbol. Um, but let's just get through it, because I think that's the last issue, except for this. All right. See where that happened. So let's see, it started with S. Oh no, that's obviously bogus. Um,
this is this code is not right, but this code is very wrong. However, so that actually works. So you can see T can come first, has no predecessors in the dependency graph. Uh, S has to come after T, but it also has to come after E. So I think that worked. Um, and if you do something like this instead, um, then E should come not just second, but very first in the order. As it indeed does. All right. I think that's about an hour and a half, so I'm going to stop now. Um, the enum stuff and some of exactly what lives in the symbol struct versus the declaration and stuff like that, all that's going to change. A lot of this is going to change, but I think this overall approach uh, in terms of separating the ordering from the rest of type resolution is probably viable. And so that's what I'll be working on today, uh, cleaning it up and reorganizing the data structures. But, uh, but anyway, so we kind of restarted on that line of attack and at least this seems to be working it just has to be kind of cleaned up and clarified so let's do some Q&A now and then we'll finish up the stream all right any questions and I'm sorry that this code is a little bit groggy oh sorry um, send back all Yeah, simdecal just introduces a declaration into the symbol table along with any other associated top level things. And it's not very clean right now, but basically the idea is that for an enumeration, I introduce constants um, for each of the enum constants, and then they're associated with the decal so that if someone ends up depending on it, they're going to order the whole enum declaration before them. Um, someone's asking if ion will have variable name shadowing. Um, if you, I assume you just mean like local variable shadowing. Uh, I haven't thought about that. Um, I, I sort of by default, I assume yes. Like is, by default, you get it sort of for free. Um, but maybe we'll make it illegal. I mean, it's, it's certainly, sometimes I actually, some I don't know. Some like, Actually, let me show you about something that I wrote the other day where I kind of, Felt that morally the right thing to do was actually variable shadowing. Here, I think the morally correct thing here is actually variable shadowing, <clears throat> because otherwise I'm saying that I'm reassigning the same thing, which is really not. I'm recomputing another version of the same thing, and so every once in a while I feel I I, I didn't end up writing it because I know some people would t bring up variable shadowing, but in some cases like that uh, you you kind of feel like those should actually be shadowed because otherwise you're implying that there's an assignment in a mut mutating sense going on, which is really not the case. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like uh, if people have strong thoughts on shadowing. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I could call it new cap. I could call it something else. I could also use go to, right? Or, but then you can't really distinguish the first and second iteration very well. But yeah, I could, I could do this as well. Which is probably better. Um, but the point is, it really is. Yeah, no, th th this is probably better. Less, com less confusing. Let's see here. Something like this. All right. So yeah. So maybe even cases like this are actually telling you that you shouldn't. You, you should have new variable declarations, but you shouldn't reuse the names. But anyway, yeah. Like m maybe we'll make shadowing illegal. I don't feel very strongly about it. Um, all right. <clears throat> Anything else? Oh, you're right. I actually used it here. So that's even, this is what I get for just diving in and changing code. Let's move it back, actually all the way back you're right because I use it down here so n is actually intentionally reassigned cap is it's not let's see so 
new cap after the buff fit, and then we provide that new cap to SN printf, and n is the total number of characters. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, like variable shadowing in general, it's, I mean, I'm all for, for making illegal, very dangerous idioms maybe, but it never struck me as something that's particularly pernicious. Um, like the, the, the things that I, I mean, there's a lot of compilers that on maximum parent paranoia level will complain about shadowing, right? Or maybe I'm wrong, but the, doesn't seem like one of the more dangerous pitfalls overall. Anyway, anything else? Some of this resolve code, I mean, you can see, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know how, how you, you all feel about this when you're coding, but I can feel when something is wrong very quickly. Um, and for me, there's always a question about do I stop when something feels wrong or do I keep going? And that's something you have to learn for yourself. But usually I force myself to keep going a certain distance until it becomes really uncomfortable because sometimes just keeping going gets you the information you need to go back and make the right decision. Whereas if as soon as something smells, smells funny, you just stop dead in your tracks, you lose all your momentum and you lose any information you would have gained by forcing yourself to go further by say a few hundred lines of code. This weekend, I forced myself to keep going while holding my nose, at least a thousand lines of code. And then at some point it just became clear that um, it was like either I hadn't, either I had missed something really fundamental that made it, uh, made, made me feel uncomfortable about it or it really was just wrong. But you know, writing this, some of this code here, like this feels extremely wrong to me. I'm just kind of doing the obvious thing to make it work, but um, I always have a very strong sense when I'm putting something in that I know will have to be completely torn out versus doing something that's 90% there in the first pass. And this is definitely the former. So uh, yeah, this code is not the prettiest we've written, but it is going to get prettier. And it's usually much easier to make something prettier uh, on second pass than it is to try to make everything perfect the first time through. So um, definitely something that I've gotten better about as I got more experienced is just knowing when to force myself to keep going through uh, through a feeling of discomfort and disgust, uh, but also knowing at some point when enough is enough and you really have to just uh, stop. But uh, for now, this is like, you know, we, we didn't get in a huge mess. We got in a little bit of a mess, but the algorithm seems pretty pretty solid. Uh, and so it's just a matter of, of, of refining it and uh, cleaning up the data structures, clarifying the role of, you know, should stuff live on the symbol or on the declaration? Clearly, right now, it's not living in the right place, but stuff like that we can uh, we can improve and refactor, and that's what I'll be doing the rest of the day anyway. All right. If anyone doesn't have questions, then we will um, we will stop in a minute or so. Yeah, one of, one of the interesting things about me doing this, um, not just live coding, which I did before, but when I'm doing coding off stream, it feels, you know, I, I feel even I, I feel even more self-conscious when I when I run into these sorts of, uh, you know, I've become much more self-introspective about why what things are stopping me when I'm losing progress or like losing momentum or. When I, when I make it, when I apply a certain habit or trick in order to force myself to make progress, like I'm kind of one of the cool benefits of, of doing this kind of project in public is that it's forcing me to be much more introspective about what habits are working and when they're not working and uh, what kind of things are stopping me. And um, I think naturally I didn't do that as much before, and it, doing this is forcing me to do it, which is interesting. But I don't know how much of this is totally idiosyncratic versus stuff that other programmers deal with. Um, but definitely the biggest difference between, say, me, post-30 versus when I was a teenager and coding is that there was a period when I was coding as a teenager when I would just ha I would have no sense of what was good or bad, and I would just keep going, and eventually I would just be in such a big mess that I couldn't get myself out. Um, then I got into a period in my 20s where I would be too sensitive to kind of local... Uh, discomfort about the approach I was taking and I would just not I would get stuck for a week at a time not really doing anything because 
I literally couldn't force myself to keep going because it felt wrong. And then eventually I got pretty good about just forcing myself to keep going a little bit further. And usually what, what happened is that you get enough just by tackling with the problem, like wrestling, uh, uh, you know, a pig in mud or whatever, you kind of get just enough. It forces your brain to think through enough of the details that you can actually come up with a better design. Uh, and now these days I mostly, I never really get totally stuck on design stuff. I, but, and I, but, but, you know, in some cases like this, I will sometimes definitely go down a dead end that I have to backtrack from. But anyway, this rambling stuff on, on personal habits, it's interesting to, uh, to have to confront this sort of publicly. I didn't have to do before. Um, someone's saying, do you think my programming has changed since I was at rad? Yeah. Like I got, I don't know if, I mean, I've gotten at least 10 times better as a programmer in the last two years, I think. And that's something pretty interesting because I feel like the potential was always there, but I had certain bad habits that were preventing me from being effective. Sometimes it was always easier for me to do it in personal projects than professional projects. But, um, so if anyone has had that experience of feeling like you could do a lot more than you're doing, figuring out what things are holding you back and working on that and trying different things until it works, I would recommend because I've gotten at least 10 times better just in the last two years. And I guess I was at RAD four years ago, so maybe 20 times better since RAD. So I feel like I really got drastically better in the last four or five years. So yeah, I'm, all the stuff I did at RAD was not particularly good. I think since then I've gotten decent, certainly relative to where I used to be. Uh, and mostly that was not getting, I don't think it was getting better as a programmer. Per, it was, but it was mostly just about figuring out bad habits and how to break them rather than you know being smarter or understanding programming better or anything like that. So if anyone else has that sort of experience, you know, work on your habits and try to m make notes of what, what helps you go fast, what slows you down, and in particular, what keeps you stuck for like weeks at a time or days at a time and figuring out how to blast through that is probably the, the biggest breakthrough I had in the last few years. Someone's asking about bad habits. Like I would say the biggest bad habit is just what, how do you get unstuck when you get stuck? Um, things like that. I mean, it's actually pretty basic, but I think it's very personal what, what you need to do for yourself. Um, but, but, but it's kind of like, it's the opposite. I feel like it's a, it's a pretty normal middle stage for a lot of programmers because when you start out, you're so, regardless of how kind of natively smart or whatever you are, um, you really don't have good taste. And so it's very easy to just blast out code. And that's why you hear a lot of people who are very productive and say they're teens, but, but, but objectively they were terrible, but they didn't have the, they didn't have the perception and the understanding that what they were doing was trash and that they were going to eventually get stuck and not be able to do anything because they were so, so, so deep down a hole with their bad decisions. Like they were making a lot of decisions basically, but they were really bad decisions. And then the, and then at some point you grow self-awareness through experience and whatnot, and you can easily become kind of paralyzed by thinking about everything that could be better and, and all and on all that stuff. And then hopefully you come out on the other side of that and you can be thoughtful, but not be completely paralyzed by your thoughtfulness. Um, but like I wrote a ton of code in my teens and it was all terrible. And then in my twenties, I felt like I kind of um, developed some habits that, of being a little too analytic and too forward thinking without um, knowing when it was just time to stop thinking and start coding. Um, and so anyway, and now I, I feel like right nowadays I'm in a good spot, but uh, I'm hoping Bitwise will help me get a lot better uh, just by f forcing myself to be super consistent, right? And uh, be accountable for the code I write and stuff like that. Anyway, it's enough philosophical personal digressions for one day. So yeah, um, obviously we're doing uh, every other day now. So uh, I feel like I got a good handle now on what I want to do for this problem. So I'm going to try to work on that uh, for the rest of the day and, and tomorrow. And uh, maybe uh, I, I should have gotten started on, until next time. I should have gotten started on things like type checking and type resolution. And so maybe the major topic for um, next stream will just be sort of type checking and type resolution, which is basically everything after the ordering minus the code generation. Um, anyway, so th I think that's it for me today, but I'll stick around on the chat for a while if anyone wants to chat or uh, if you have follow-up questions.